Hey guys, welcome back to another something in about five minutes and today we are talking all about BLS Airways. So let's get started. So guys, this is more of a intro video for the BLS Airway. What is it? Why we use it? Uh, how we measure it? And, uh, and I'm going to answer one very common question that I get from a lot of EMT students and even more refresher students. So first off, what is a BLS Airway? A BLS adjunct a BLS airway adjunct is just a piece of plastic, uh, you know, like an OPA like this, or a piece of rubber like an NPA like this. And they are going to create a stable airway uh, for the BLS or ALS provider prior to intubation or use of a secondary airway like a King or a combi tube. So the first one is this OPA, right? That's this little guy here. Okay, these come in sizes from infant all the way up to this one, which is the largest adult. And the OPA just stands for oropharyngeal airway. Okay, uh, the NPA, which is the rubber one, again, comes in a multitude of different sizes. And that one is just the, uh, the nasopharyngeal airway. And really, these airways are used in patients that need a protected airway. So when might you use these, okay? The OPA, you're gonna use these in typically your unconscious patients with no gag reflex, okay? Imagine sticking this down you know, your throat when you're conscious or semi-conscious, how easily you would gag on it and or you know, vomit everything back up you just had for lunch. So this is why we typically use the OPA or the oropharyngeal airway when they are unconscious with no gag reflex. Okay, if they're unconscious with a gag reflex, then we're going to switch over to the NPA. Um, the other time that we might use the, uh, the OPA is when there is a, uh, a head injury or a significant head injury. Okay, now over to the NPA, the, the nasopharyngeal airway I'm going to use on my semi-conscious patients, my conscious patients that need airway control, all the way up to my unconscious patients that need airway control. These guys can have a gag reflex. Um, typically, if you know you go to an unconscious patient that has a gag reflex, you're you're gonna try this, find out they have a gag reflex, and then you're gonna switch to the NPA. Okay. The other time that I might go right to the NPA is with uh, any type of oral trauma or trismus. Trismus is just the inability to open up the lower jaw. So they're, they're pretty much, you'll hear the word clenched, which is where they can't open their lower jaw. So in my diagram here, you have uh, you know, a really rough understanding of where the large landmarks are within the upper airway tract, right? You have the nasopharynx, you have the oropharynx, you have the pharynx, the larynx, uh, you have the epiglottis, which covers uh, your trachea to allow, uh, you know, food to go down your esophagus and not into your lungs. And then you have the tongue and the soft palate. I bring up the tongue solely because that is our target with BLS airways. Okay. Our tongue is the biggest structure. It's a, it's a large muscle within the oropharynx that is going to ultimately clog up the airway. We're either looking to one, move the tongue or two, bypass the tongue so we can better ventilate our patients. Now, when we are measuring the OPA, we're gonna measure this span right here, the tip of the mouth to the, to the tip of the jaw here, where you actually have the bend in your jaw. Okay, just like this, uh, you know, this image here that I took for you guys, just so you could see, this is how we're going to measure a, uh, a OPA. Now, when we insert the OPA, this is about what it's going to look like if sized appropriately, okay? We're going to have it resting on the teeth, it's gonna come around the tongue, and it's gonna sit inside the oropharynx just above the epiglottis. If you get down too low because you've sized it too uh, say too big, it's going to sit either above the teeth or it's going to start tickling the epiglottis and might give them that, that gag reflex. Or if it's too, uh, too small because you've, you haven't measured it quite good enough, 
it won't cover the rest of the tongue and it won't be as effective uh, in blocking that tongue into the oropharynx. Now, what about when we do the nasopharyngeal airway, the NPA? When we're measuring that, we're gonna go from the tip of the ear to the tip of the nose. This span right here is where we're going to measure the NPA. And once we move inside the body and place that NPA, this is what it should look like. We're gonna go in through uh, one of the nostrils. It's gonna go through the nasopharynx down into the oropharynx. Now, it should not be long enough that it's going to start tickling somebody's epiglottis. We can start, you know, if we're if it's too long, we're going to start tickling that epiglottis and cause them possibly a gag reflex. However, we don't want it too short that it doesn't uh, pass the tongue either. So we don't want it sitting in that nasopharynx. We want it coming down into that oropharynx so it gets by the tongue and the tongue can't obstruct it. All right, so you guys have all seen somebody, I'm sure, talk about this kind of airway. I call it the super airway, right? We're gonna put everything that we can, every orifice, if the ears led to the airway, I'm sure some provider would try and shove airways into the, uh, into the person's ears to try and ventilate them. Now, I get a lot of questions in regards to this type of airway situation, right? They're putting an OPA in, but then they're dueling two NPAs in. And, they're, and their thought process is, well, I have three ways of getting ventilation down and, you know, down into the lungs. Is this productive? Is this beneficial to your patients? Okay. And I'm going to answer that question here today. So I typically say, no, this is not beneficial to your patients. And here is, and here is why. So when all of these uh, nasopharyngeal airways and oropharyngeal airways meet in the oropharynx, they actually block each other, okay? You can see here with my little pink circle, they actually block each other. So what happens is when this comes in, Sorry about that. When this comes in and it's sitting in the oropharynx, right? Here's, we're gonna say, this is the tongue and it's sitting in the oropharynx, right? And now the nasal, the nasal tube comes through and it sits in the, or, in the, it tries to sit in the oropharynx coming from the nasopharynx. But guess what's in the way? The OPA, right? It can't get down into here. So this is actually blocking all of your airflow, which is typically why when you place an OPA and then you try and place an NPA, you get resistance because it's pushing against this OPA, okay? So what I typically will say to people who want to do this or say, oh yeah, it's a great idea, I'm better auctioning my patient. I say, no, you're actually making one of these airways completely and utterly useless. And typically it's the NPAs. So what I'd rather do is I would rather use an OPA and ventilate that way and leave my nasal passageways open for passive oxygenation, or I'm going to use the an NPA and one NPA only, and I'm gonna ventilate that way, allowing for passive oxygenation on the one, ventilation, you know, uh, good ventilation on the one with the NPA in it. And then if I need to be able to give like Narcan or I want to put in an end title or something like that, I have a free nostril to be able to do that. So that's typically why I say don't do the super airway of two nasal tubes and then and OPA. So guys, I hope this was quick and informative. Like I said, it was an intro to, uh, to the OPA and to the NPA. Next week, we're actually going to be measuring these and inserting these on a, uh, on a mannequin so you can see exactly how the skill processes work and how to go about uh, measuring, sizing properly and inserting these airways. So stay safe out there and I will see you guys next Tuesday.